Health, psychology, and human nature with Andre Stureson. Hey friends, hope you're having a great day. Are you following me on Instagram and Facebook? Please go to Health, Psychology and Human Nature on Instagram or Facebook or both for that matter to get the latest episodes, inspiration and more. Please take a pause and go there. Also, if you like the episode, please share it with a friend, family member or somebody else who you think might like it. Friends, welcome back to another episode. Today you will learn everything you need to know about vitamin D. What it is, what it is you need to measure, the effects on health, mental health, cognition, autoimmune disease, the brain and our genes. You will also learn how much vitamin D you need to take to get into the optimal range. In this episode, I'm interviewing Professor Michael Hollick, who is an internationally recognized expert in the field of vitamin D. He has published over 800 journal articles, book chapters, editorials, and proceedings, and also written 13 books in which one of them is the vitamin D solution. Friends, please enjoy. Welcome to, welcome to the show, Michael. It's a pleasure to be here. It's such a pleasure. I, I, I saw a YouTube clip of you where you were talking about the delightful vitamin D. Yes. It's a delightful vitamin, isn't it? I'd say. Yeah. Since the major source of vitamin D for most humans on this planet is sensible exposure to sunlight. Yeah. And I, I also saw that you, you tried... Uh, you you made a, a study yourself to see if you could get D vitamin during the winter months. Correct. We did studies around the globe and showed that basically if you live above Atlanta, Georgia, that's about 35 degrees north or 35 degrees south, um, you will not make any significant vitamin D in your skin from sun exposure from about beginning of November and starting again, probably in April. Yeah. And probably and the same obviously below the equator. It's just the opposite. Exactly. So, so vitamin D, like what would you say, what is vitamin D in a nutshell? So vitamin D is a hormone for sure, because it's made in your skin. So by definition, it's a hormone and uh, we all recognize it as being important for bone health and for calcium metabolism. Right. And, and, and the vitamin D, why, why, why have you been, because you have been doing quite a lot of studies on this, why the interest in vitamin D? Right. So you would think, of course, that um, I, I kind of gravitated toward this, but it turns out that when... I was a graduate student back in 1969 and looking for a mentor. Uh, most of the hot areas like um, the discovery of DNA and RNA and, and um, sugar metabolism were all f- filled with postdoctoral fellows and they didn't need a graduate student. And so they sent me over to a laboratory, Dr. DeLuca's lab, who was working in vitamin D. And I said to them, I don't have any interest in working in vitamin D and it (laughs) doesn't matter whether you have an interest or not. That's likely what you're going to be doing because that's what's available. And so it turned out that, uh, it basically made, a um, a a pig's ear into a golden purse. I mean, little would I know that by being a, the graduate student there that I was responsible for identification of the major circulating form of vitamin D in human blood, which is 25 hydroxy vitamin D. And then went on after getting my master's degree, my PhD for the identification of the active form of vitamin D that's made in your kidneys known as 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. And I've been fascinated with the vitamin D story ever since. Yeah, and you've been, I, I've seen 
I mean, you've written a book about this, and I've also seen you you're you're lecturing about this. So there's there's a you have a quite wide wide approach to it as well. I mean, you're going through a, a lot of different aspects and and the effects of a lot of varied topics as well. Yes, I mean it's quite remarkable that um, we always thought that vitamin D was important for bone health, prevents rickets in children. So it, it appeared to be kind of a boring vitamin. But we now realize <laughs> that basically every organ and tissue in your body has a vitamin D receptor, which means that those cells and organs likely respond in some way. And um, there's now really good evidence, I think, that vitamin D plays a critical role in maintaining good health throughout your life by helping to reduce risk of autoimmune diseases, cancer, um, improving uh, mental health, uh, reducing risk for type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease, and even infectious diseases. Right. I, I, I listened to a, a researcher who used vitamin D in, in his program to affect and, and actually also reverse cognitive decline. And and he, he he in his book mentioned that that vitamin D actually could affect uh, like I think it, I think it wrote nine hundred different genes. Is that something that you're like how many how many genes does it actually affect vitamin D? Right. So we actually did the study. So as opposed to speculating, and so we did, we've done two studies now. The first study we gave two thousand IU's of vitamin D a day to healthy adults for three months in Boston, they were vitamin D deficient or insufficient, and we gave them 2,000 international units a day. And we showed that 291 genes were either up or down regulated, that there were, thereby vitamin D was having some effect on them. Yeah. And when we looked at these genes and what they did, these genes control probably more than 80 different um, biologic pathways from um, regulating cellular growth, reducing risk for cancer, modulating your immune system, um, and a whole host of other activities. But now we've just completed another study where we gave healthy adults for six months either 600, 4,000, or 10,000 IUs daily. And then we not only measured their blood calcium and 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels, but we measured gene expression at the beginning and the end. And what we found very nicely was for 600 genes, uh, for 600 international units taken for that six months, a, a few hundred genes were uh, affected. On 2,000 units, about three to 400 genes were affected. But on 10,000 units a day, more than 12 hundred genes were affected. And so really? we think that more than a thousand genes, at least just in your immune system, because we only looked at white blood cells, right, yeah. are affected. So yeah, it's probably closer to two thousand genes being directly or indirectly controlled in some way by vitamin D. I mean, you know much more than me about this, but but what we have two twenty thousand genes in total, right? Correct. So so that's well, so thirty thousand, I think around twenty six thousand or so. But yeah, it's it's in the range. Yeah, like twenty twenty to thirty yep. thousand. So it's it's pretty much like probably around ten percent of the genes that are actually affected by vitamin D in some way. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. And- <laughs> And Karsten Kahlberg uh, in Finland has has done kind of very similar studies um, looking at um, genes and uh, what are called responsive elements, and he concludes the same thing. All right. So, so you 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 mentioned that it was affecting mental health. Could you tell us a little bit more about the research about vitamin D's effects on mental health? Well, there was an animal study done to show that. Vitamin D deficient rodents, um, when given vitamin D, improved serotonin levels in the brain. Yeah, and um, and that's basically what how antidepressants work. And there is evidence that 
uh, depression and neurocognitive dysfunction and even Alzheimer's disease has been related to chronic vitamin D deficiency. Have there been like any randomized controlled tri- randomized controlled trials with humans with when with using vitamin D for depression? There was one study that was performed um, because it's also known that depression and seasonal affective disorder uh, is related to light um, intensity and duration hitting the retina and and affecting the pineal gland melatonin. And so a study was done to see whether or not giving vitamin D to individuals that were affected by seasonal affective disorder um, had improvement in their symptoms, and they suggested that there was. Um, So that's one study that kind of implicates vitamin D in helping. Alzheimer's disease take a very long time, so there is no randomized controlled trial for it. No, of course. And a study done out of uh, Australia showed that neurocognitive dys- dysfunction was very prevalent, especially in elders that were severely vitamin D deficient. Hmm. Do you know how also, if I mean, in the research about how it affects the brain? Well, we know that vitamin D receptors exist in the brain. We know that the brain can activate vitamin D. And so we're pretty confident that vitamin D does play a very significant role in the brain, yeah. maybe helping to um, control um, um, various signaling in the brain. But the exact mechanism for this is really not known. I wrote a review on this a couple of years ago and kind of related um, how the vitamin D receptor can alter uh, neurotransmitter activity, uh, dopamine concentrations, um, all which, of course, uh, can affect mood and other biologic functions of your central nervous system. Right. So, so it affects uh, dopamine and neurotransmitter. Does it affect any, and you also talked about serotonin in this rodent studies. Has, has there been any other neuro, neurotransmitters or hormones or other other things that has been shown to be affected as well? I mean, they, they think that maybe, um, because remember, when we're talking about vitamin D, we're talking about when it gets activated, yeah. um, that either in the brain or in your kidneys. So it's 125 dihydroxy vitamin D that likely is doing this. And so they think that maybe some of the enzymes uh, that are related to neurotransmission may also be uh, influenced. We also know, by the way, that um, severe proximal muscle weakness that can actually look like uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, right? Um, Lou Gehrig's disease, which is really a a deadly uh, autoimmune disorder, um, that even though vitamin D does not treat ALS, there have been reports of patients that present with severe neuromuscular dysfunction who were vitamin D deficient and treated with vitamin D had dramatic improvement um, in their neuromuscular function. Uh, So we talked a little bit about the brain and we also talked about neurotransmitters. But what about the the body? So how do, how does it affect <laughs> apart from our brain and and our head? What how does it affect other things in our body? Well, it turns out we had done studies many years ago because I was just curious to know is that the skin, which is your largest organ in your body, has a vitamin D receptor, and we know that the skin produces vitamin D. So the obvious question. For me, back in the 1980s, was why would your skin cells have a vitamin D receptor? Yeah. So we grew skin cells, cultured keratinocytes. We added 125 dihydroxy vitamin D to them, and we found that it markedly inhibited their proliferation, and it induced them to differentiate normally. Mm. So why is that important? Because there is a skin disorder known as psoriasis, which afflicts about 2% of the world's population. 
And this disorder is a defect in the proliferation and differentiation of keratinocytes. So what we did was we initiated a study and asked the question that if active vitamin D can be so potent in inhibiting proliferation and inducing normal differentiation, could it be used to treat psoriasis? And so back in the mid 80s and early 90s, we published several papers showing that you can topically apply 125 dihydroxy vitamin D3, and it was very effective in reversing many of the um, issues associated with psoriasis, which is the hyperproliferation of the skin cells and, the, and improved the dis differentiation um, defect. So that these patients often had dramatic improvement in their symptoms. As a result of that observation, um, several companies developed active vitamin D analogs that are a treatment choice for patients with psoriasis in limited areas of their body, like their elbows and knees or, or small patches on, on their arms or legs. So right. long story short is that if active vitamin D can inhibit proliferation, induce terminal differentiation in keratinocytes, what about other cells in your body? And it turns out it'll do the same thing in breast cells, in colon cells. And so we think that this may be one of the reasons why improvement in vitamin D status reduces risk of many deadly cancers. Um, there was a study done uh, in the Nurses Health Study at Harvard and showed that nurses that had the highest blood levels of 25-hydroxy vitamin D in the range of about 40 to 50 nanograms per ml, that it reduced their risk of developing breast cancer by about 50%. And a study done up in Canada where they showed that women who had the most sun exposure during their late childhood and early life reduced their risk of developing breast cancer later in life by almost 70%. And that's compared to women that were not exposed to very much sunlight matched for both um, sex and skin type. So we think that vitamin D, improving your vitamin D status is very important for the local regulation of cellular growth, which helps to reduce risk of many deadly cancers, including colon and breast in particular. But um, Dr. Grant has shown from his epidemiologic analyses that upwards of, of more than 10 different deadly cancers may be related to vitamin D deficiency. Right. Does it also affect all-cause mortality? It does. And so um, there's a very nice meta-analysis performed by Dr. Garland, and he showed very nicely, and this has been confirmed even by the Institute of Medicine, that if you're vitamin D deficient, you most definitely have a higher risk of mortality, and usually it's cardiovascular in nature. And a study done in Germany showed the same thing, about a 25 to 30% reduced risk. And you will continue to develop, continue to have that benefit as you improve your vitamin D status. And the maximum benefit is when your blood level of 25 hydroxy vitamin D is above about 30 to 40 nanograms per ml. And Dr. Garland went on to show that that benefit continued even when your blood levels were as high as 70 nanograms per ml. Wow. That is, yeah, that is quite interesting. So it's, so it's, if you had 30 or 40, that's, that was, that was good. But if you have 70, then it's, that's even better. No, I didn't say that. What I said was that we think that it begins to plateau, that the, the benefit, uh, begins to, um, be at its maximum at around 30 to 40, but it's okay. been argued by others, including the Institute of Medicine, that you have increased risk of mortality above 50. And so they have what's called the U curve or the J-shaped curve. But Dr. Garland, after looking at his meta-analysis, did not show that. So that the benefit continued out to greater than 70 nanograms per ml. 
Right. Just just so I'm I'm with you here. So it's better to have. So it was be- better to have seventy that there, there wasn't this U formed. So or, there wasn't this U formed, so that you didn't increase risk, but there right. was no additional benefit. Okay. Okay. Now I get it. Okay. Yeah. Now I get it. All right. So, but I mean, if if, if you look at uh, from an evolutionary perspective. What do you think about like the evolutionary relationship to vitamin D? So there's really, there's a very nice study that was done and then a a follow-up study that kind of, I think, gives us an insight. And that is that Lux Walda had published several years ago that he evaluated blood levels of 25-hydroxy vitamin D in two different um, African uh, populations um, who are herders, so who are outside all the time. And so, for example, Maasai herders. And he found that their blood levels were between 40 and 50 nanograms per ml. Right. Now, for you to get to that level, you would re- need to take 4,000 to 5,000 international units of vitamin D daily. Hmm. The other study that was done that kind of helps to give an insight is that it's well documented that human breast milk essentially contains no vitamin D. So if you give your infant human breast milk as a sole source of nutrition, that infant will be vitamin D deficient for that period of time if they're not getting a supplement. But then when you think about this from an evolution perspective, of course, that makes no sense, right? Why wouldn't human breast milk contain vitamin D? Yeah. And the reason is simple which is that our hunter-gatherers, lactating women, outside every day, were making thousands of units of vitamin D. So a study was done in South Carolina. Bruce Hollis and Carol Wagner published and showed if you give lactating women 6,000 IUs of vitamin D a day, they put enough vitamin D in their milk to satisfy their infant's requirement. Hmm. So this, to me you know, continues to suggest that we should be maintaining blood levels in that range of around 40 to 50 nanograms per ml. And that to do that, you would require, if you normal weight adult, at least three and probably more like 5,000 international units of vitamin D a day. And uh, uh, if you're obese, we and others have shown um, that you need two to three times more. Okay, so so you you need you probably need five thousand international units just to keep your levels at forty to fifty. That's not increasing correct. Or, okay, just to, yeah. Yep, two thousand units will get you around thirty to forty uh, nanograms per ml. Yeah, uh, and we did a study where we gave fifty thousand units once every two weeks for six <laughs> years. How much was it again? So 50,000 international units every two weeks. So it's 100,000 units a month for six years. And we showed that on average, their blood level was around 40 nanograms per ml Hmm. with no toxicity. And so that's equivalent to taking 3,300 units a day. Right. And when you were talking about... Um, 6,000 international units a day. And my blood level recently was checked. It was 72 nanograms per ml. Your, yours is 72? Yep. Okay. So so this is quite interesting then. What would you say, What what is an, if you, if we, we've been talking about different health benefits, what would you say is the optimal range of nanograms per milliliter of vitamin D in your blood? <laughs> So the Endocrine Society practice guidelines, and I chaired that committee with experts uh, from around the world who were on that committee. And what we recommended for physicians uh, and healthcare professionals, that the blood level preferred range is 40 to 60 nanograms per ml, and that up to 100 is perfectly safe. And you don't have to worry about toxicity until you're over 150 nanograms per ml. And for your listeners, they should be aware 
that one nanogram is equal to 2.5 nanomoles per liter. So in Europe, where they use nanomoles per liter, um, you can translate what, what I'm saying into, into those units. Exactly. I, I I mean, I'm from Sweden. I tested this in uh, with a with a company. I used a, a company to yeah to order to order a blood test of vitamin D, and I had 70 nanomolars per liter, which is 28 nanograms per li- milliliter. So yeah, you take yeah. nanograms times 2.5, and then you get yep. the nanomoles. Yep. Good. And so your vitamin D insufficient. Exactly. So now I've been taking supplements. <laughs> for you i mean basically you know i keep telling you know people keep asking me this question you know how much sunlight should i be getting how much vitamin d should i take everybody on this planet unless you're a hunter gatherer like maasai herders or you're a lifeguard right you cannot get enough vitamin d from sunlight and there's essentially no vitamin d in your diet it's only wild caught oily fish like salmon mackerel herring and cod liver oil and mushrooms exposed to sunlight. And then in some countries like the United States and Finland and Sweden, and now in uh, India, is that milk is fortified with vitamin D. In in most countries, there's only 100 units in eight ounces. So you're getting a little bit, but not the necessary amount. And uh, mushrooms exposed to sunlight can have about 500 units in a serving. Um, and so that could be another source. But basically, if you aren't eating salmon every day or mushrooms exposed to sunlight every day, uh, you're going to be vitamin D deficient. And that's why basically 40 percent of the world's population is deficient and 60 percent are deficient or insufficient. Yeah. And and you said that 40 to 60 nanograms per um, milliliter was the good range you have a, a little bit higher than that you have you had 72 do you think i mean this is not uh, i mean do, do you think that is even better to have 72 or we just don't know i no, okay. personally probably not but we just don't know right. however there's a different part of the story that's now evolving which is fascinating me even more which is is it possible that we also require to maintain our blood level of vitamin D, not only 25 hydroxy vitamin D, right, which is made in your liver from vitamin D, but maybe the initial precursor, vitamin D, which you make in your skin or you can ingest. And the reason for this is that there was a a remarkable study that was performed where they looked at endothelial uh, membrane function. And it turns out that that endothelial membrane stability is associated with improved health and reduced risk for inflammatory diseases and cardiovascular disease. Hmm. And so if you can stabilize endothelial membranes, that means that it potentially has a positive benefit. And so a company decided that they develop a screening technique to look for compounds that would be unique in stabilizing endothelial membranes. And after screening hundreds to thousands of compounds, the compound that worked the best was vitamin D. (laughs) It was much more effective than 25 hydroxy vitamin D, three, but more than a thousand fold. Wow. And... Uh, also more effective than 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. And again, when you think about this from an evolution perspective, this is probably what Mother Nature intended. Because you, when you're exposed to sunlight, you make vitamin D in your skin. Yeah. And when you're making vitamin D in your skin, as you probably are aware, you don't make vitamin D, right? You make pre-vitamin D, yeah. which is thermally unstable and converts to vitamin D3 in your skin, which is slowly released into your bloodstream. So that means that you maintain a blood level of vitamin D at all times, right? Yeah. And so, and, and it could be that that is as important or even more important in the end 
than that being able to maintain your 25 hydroxy vitamin D uh, above 40 to 60 nanograms per ml. Okay, so another dimension. And so, and also, so when you're when you're testing, when if you're going to test your vitamin D levels, it's um, it's twenty five hydroxy. Is that the same thing as twenty five hydroxy cholecalciferol? Yes and or, no. Yes and no. Okay. So, right, and the reason is twenty five hydroxy cholecalciferol. So calciferol is vitamin D three. So yeah. therefore, twenty five hydroxy cholecalciferol is 25 hydroxy vitamin D3. Yeah. And so if you're not eating sun-dried mushrooms or taking vitamin D2, that's okay. So that means if you measure your 25 hydroxy vitamin D3, you will know your vitamin D status. However, yeah. if you're eating mushrooms exposed to sunlight or getting vitamin D2 from some source, then you also need to measure 25 hydroxy vitamin D2. And mm. so it's the combination of 25 hydroxy vitamin D3 plus 25 hydroxy vitamin D2. It's the total that you care about. Right. But when you go to a, your doctor and, and they take a blood test, what is it that is u- most usually measured? Right. So if it only comes back as a nu- one number, say 25 hydroxy vitamin D total, then yeah. it's the total of both. However, there are some assays that are just more expensive and more cumbersome called liquid chromatography tandem mass spectroscopy. And they quantitatively measure 25 hydroxy vitamin D2 and 25 hydroxy vitamin D3. And then they add them up and they give you all of those numbers, including the total. Right. So if you, if, but, but if you go to uh, um, a nearby, doctor and they they test it then you get the total of vitamin d2 and d3 together correct that is that is 25 hydroxy correct okay okay but and the this companies they do something they take it to the next level and give you the amount of d2 d3 etc a few reference labs provide that kind of service yes right and would you say and 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 so would you say that having a high amount of both D2 and D3 is more important than to having only D3, for example. No. No. And so I I'll constantly get... <laughs> um, <laughs> You're bored of that question. <laughs> yeah. No, I get inquiries from doctors because when they get the, these blood levels of 25-hydroxy D2 and 25-hydroxy D3, they somehow think that, oh my heavens, they have no D2. And so they can't therefore convert it to D3 or D3 can't be converted to D2. They're not related at all. Vitamin right. D2 gets converted to 25 hydroxy D2. Vitamin D3 gets converted to 25 hydroxy vitamin D3. The okay. kidneys recognize both and they convert it to their one hydroxylated metabolite. So now right. you have 125 dihydroxy vitamin D2 and 125 dihydroxy vitamin D3 in your bloodstream. Right. So about getting your vitamin D then, I mean, I mean, you have talked about the sun, which is the natural source. Um, if you like, what, what would be your instructions to be able to get enough of vitamin D if you only get it from the sun? Right. So t- three simple, uh, I think, things to give some thought to. The first and the most and the easiest, of course, is use an app. And yeah. so we've developed the app. Right, called <laughs> minder.info. So D M I N D E R dot I N F O, right? Yeah. Ontometrics um, developed this and, and uh, helped them put this together. It'll tell you anywhere on the planet when you can make vitamin D, how much vitamin D you're making based on your skin type and your age. And it warns you to get out of the sun so you don't get a sunburn. Right. The reason this is important is because the zenith angle of the sun is what you have to worry about. And so even at the equator at 8 o'clock in the morning, exposed to sunlight, you make no vitamin D. Hmm. Because the zenith angle has to be less than 35 degrees. And right. the way you know that is that if you are standing in the sun, directly in front of the sun, and you look at your your shadow if your shadow 
is longer than your height, that means the zenith angle is 35 degrees or greater. And okay. therefore, you're not likely to make any significant vitamin D in your skin. So typically, we recommend that you only can make adequate vitamin D from 10 a.m. until about 2 to 3 p.m. Mm. anywhere on the planet. And if you live above Atlanta, Georgia, you could not make any um, starting, in, like I said, around November and don't, don't begin again until around end of March. And if you're in Europe, six months of the year, you basically cannot make any vitamin D. We did a study in Edmonton, Canada. We did a study in northern Norway. And basically from about September until end of April, you will not make any significant vitamin D in your skin from sun exposure. Right. But when you're out there, like let, let's say that we are in Sweden during those few months or 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 in the northern parts of the US in the and like how how much do you have to be out during the good vitamin D season to get your yeah. vitamin D? Yeah, good question. So like I said, use the app. It's the best source. But the other rule of thumb is that if you know your skin sensitivity, so you're out um, uh, on a beach in Sweden and you know that you're going to get a mild sunburn after being out there for about 45 minutes, then I would recommend about half that time. Arms, okay. like abdomen and back, if you can, if you're in a bathing suit but always protect your face. And then after that exposure, wear clothing and or sunscreen so that you're now getting advantage of the beneficial effect, preventing the damaging effects from excessive exposure. You never want to get a sunburn. Right, so half the time when you get the sunburn is a good way. Like how much are you getting then? So, so we did a study and we showed that um, if you get what's called a minimal erythemal dose, so it's not a sunburn, right? So it's a light pinkness to your skin 24 hours later. So not a sunburn, right? Yeah. If you expose your body in a bathing suit, it's equivalent to ingesting about 15,000 to 20,000 units of vitamin D. So that's your whole body in a bathing suit, right? 360 degrees. Right. So, so if you go in for half the time, it's probably in the range of about 10,000 international units. Okay. All right. So being outside for, let's say, 15 minutes, uh, like two or three times a week, then you will get like 60,000 or something. Or not 15, but yeah. Yep. Again, it depends upon. So remember that that we did the study in a tanning bed, right? So, so that they were lying down and they were being exposed 360 degrees to this radiation, right? Right. So right, when yeah. the sun, you're only getting it 180 degrees max, right? Right. All right. But okay. So, so let's, let's talk about supplements then, which is a, perhaps an easier way now when it's getting darker in the d darker season. If, if, um, if you're not at the at the good level, if you're like me, I was at 28 before. How much would you recommend to take per day, and for how long? Right. I mean, basically, what I tell all of my patients, and I do myself, is to just take a supplement every day. That's your best bet. And don't worry about summer and winter. It doesn't make any difference. We showed in almost 3.8 million samples in the United States the seasonal variation, right? And the amount of sunlight that people get is so little that their change is no more than about eight to 10 nanograms per ml in the yeah. summer versus the winter. And so getting sun exposure is perfectly fine, but you definitely still need to take a supplement, yeah. right? And so I recommend minimum 2,000 international units of vitamin D a day. Right. Okay. That's 50 micrograms of vitamin D a day. And um, and that will get you in the range of 30 to 40 nanograms per ml. If you're obese, you need two to three times more. But if you want to get into 40 to 60 nanogram range, which is what we consider to be the preferred range and probably maximum health benefits, then I think you should be on three to five thousand units of vitamin D a day. Yeah. 
Okay, so three, three to five thousand a day, and when you are at these optimal levels, let's say you're at fifty, then you still continue to take um, the same amount. Right, because you would think, of course, that what's happening is that as you're taking this amount of vitamin D, that it's going to build up in your body fat, and that you're going to continue to increase your blood level. It turns out, for reasons that we don't understand, <laughs> is that the, level, that the amount of vitamin D that you take for up after eight weeks, that that blood level will not significantly change. Hmm. And it was a very nice study done in Canada, where they showed that people, some people in Canada, were taking up to twenty thousand units of vitamin D a day for years, and their blood levels were in the range of sixty to eighty nanograms per mL. Okay. Yeah, that's that's quite a lot. They take that that much, right? Or is it twenty thousand? Yeah, I don't recommend taking that much. But if you're obese, right, and you and yeah, I recommend yeah, true, three to five thousand, you could get there. True, true. And you said that, like, so what what would be, let's say, uh, is there like a harmful upper limit or something like, like, is there a daily maximum you could take? Yeah, I mean. For most people, I mean, there's some rare conditions where you have to be careful, like a granulomatous disorder, like sarcoidosis, for example, or a 24-hydroxylase deficiency. These are very rare, but uh, important to know about and to be careful about how much vitamin D you take because you'll raise your blood calcium very quickly. But for most people, you really need to take literally 50 to 100,000 up to a million units a day for months to years before you begin to become vitamin D toxic. So it's essentially impossible to become vitamin D toxic, especially on 5,000 units of vitamin D a day. Okay, yeah. It's, it's perhaps that it's a thousand, like 5,000. It's something that perhaps people think it sounds a lot when it's like five or 20,000 instead of being, if it, would, if it would have been five, then people would have perhaps wouldn't have been like, oh, yeah. I will take five vitamin D units a day, then then that probably wouldn't have had the same effect. So, yeah. So like I said, you have to take literally hundreds of thousands of units a day, a day, for yeah, yeah. half a year to a year. I mean, we had one study we published in the New England Journal of Medicine several years ago where a gentleman was keen back in the 90s to um, – improve his vitamin D status because he worried about prostate cancer since there was this association with vitamin D deficiency and prostate cancer. And so he went to a local pharmacy in the United States. Back in the 1990s, nobody cared about vitamin D. You could not buy a vitamin D supplement in any pharmacy in the United States, basically. So he went on the internet and he bought a product. And the product told him to take two teaspoons a day and that would give him 2,000 units a day. Okay. So he did for a year, and then he called me up, and and he he was really upset because I had been recommending two thousand units a day, and he was severely intoxicated. So I told him, look, why don't you send it up, and we'll do an analysis for you. The yeah. company forgot to dilute it. He was taking two teaspoons of pure crystalline vitamin D a day, <laughs> for a year, which was a million units a day. Yeah. His blood level was over 500 nanograms per mL, Whoa. and his calcium <laughs> was 15, um, right. which is very high. And so I took him off all vitamin D, and his 25-hydroxy-D gradually came down after a couple of years, but he had no problem. I mean, he totally recovered without any uh, complication. Okay, yeah, then, then, then taking 5,000 really doesn't have any adverse effects. I was also, I was also thinking about, because I've also heard that you need to take vitamin K2 when you take vitamin D. Is that correct? No. It's not? Okay. Can you tell me, can you tell me more about that? Pure and simple, no. Okay. Fact, <laughs> it, and it's a straight concept, up answer. Yeah, the concept is simple, which is people have argued, based on some studies in Holland in particular, and in Japan, that those that have the highest intake of vitamin K or vitamin K2 in particular have better bone density and less cardiovascular calcification. So therefore, it's been concluded that vitamin K2, which affects gamma carboxylation of certain proteins like osteocalc osteocalcin, for example, in your bone, right, is important to tell the body 
to use the calcium that vitamin D is helping to promote absorption into your bloodstream to go to your bones and not into your blood vessels. In my okay. opinion, there's little evidence for this. A recent study suggested actually it may increase risk, but there's no evidence whatsoever that vitamin K2 works in concert with vitamin D. Hmm. So I tell my patients, if you want to take it, it's okay by me, but I don't think it's going to have any significant benefit. Right. Is there something that increased the bio bioavailability of vitamin D? So we did a study because, as you may be aware, in the United States, vitamin D is an orange juice, right? So yeah. you would think that vitamin D, in order to be absorbed, needs fat or it needs to be taken with food because there's a lot of stuff on the Internet to imply that. So we did studies and we showed that vitamin D in skim milk, which has no fat, and whole milk, its bioavailability is exactly the same. If we have it in corn oil versus putting it on a piece of toast, it was perfectly bioavailable. Mm. If it was put in orange juice versus milk, it was perfectly bioavailable. We've done studies with vitamin D ingestion in um, with an empty stomach, with a full stomach, with fat, without fat, with food, without food, didn't make any difference they were able to absorb the vitamin D as long as it was formulated properly. Okay, that's, that's good to know. Um, also, I was also wondering, is it, does it matter? Because you, before we talked about the vitamin D2 and D3. So does it matter if you take a vitamin D3 or D2 supplement? There's a lot of information on the internet implying that vitamin D2 is much, much less effective than vitamin D3. We did the study, and we did a couple of studies, actually. It's so good it, with you. It's always, you always, it's like, we did a study of that, well, actually. <laughs> it's I, perfect. I mean, because I'm always curious to, to know whether or not the stuff is true or not. Because Yeah, for sure, for sure. It's great. It's great. Men. So we did a couple of studies. The first study we did was we did 1,000 units of vitamin D2 versus 1,000 units of vitamin D3 and formulated identically. And then to leave no stone unturned, we also formulated another capsule containing 500 units of vitamin D2 and 500 units of vitamin D3 together. And we gave this to healthy adults. And we showed that their blood levels of 25 hydroxy vitamin D were the same. And then the next question would be, well, what about the kidneys? Can they recognize it the same way? And what about the blood levels of 125 dihydroxy vitamin D? And we showed they were identical. The total never changed. Mm, okay. We also did a study with mushroom powder with vitamin D2 and compared it to vitamin D3 from a well-known supplement. And the blood levels essentially were identical. So in my opinion, physiologic doses of vitamin D2 and vitamin D3 are equally effective in maintaining your blood levels of total 25 hydroxy vitamin D as well as 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. When it comes to supplements, if you're going to choose, let's say you go to amazon.com or another web page and you're looking to to buy a, a vitamin D supplement, what uh, what are you supposed to look for? Be careful is what I tell you is I tell I tell my patients if they want to do this that they should Make sure that it's well-respected national or international brand, right? Yeah. Um, you know, these kind of fly-by-night companies making all these kind of supplements, I don't think you can really depend on quality. And uh, you have no idea how much you're ingesting. Uh, I personally, because I endorse the product, and so people should be aware of that, it's called Vital Choice. And Vital Choice is a company out of Alaska. And what they do is they formulate vitamin D3 from wild-caught salmon. Mm, okay. And they have it either as a um, supplement in 2,000 international units in, in a little bit of salmon oil, or they have it as 1,000 units in um, a significant amount of omega-3 fatty acids, which, of course, have additional potential um, health benefits for your heart. Right. And, and when you're looking at these, so, so it's a well-respected brand, but are, are you also supposed to look for, um, I mean, a, a, spef a specific molecule, like the, the name of, of the molecule as well? 
You can. I mean, there really are only two, <laughs> right? Yeah. Choline calciferol, which is vitamin D3, and ergo calciferol, which is vitamin D2. Yeah, and it doesn't matter which one it is. In my opinion, no, based on the studies that we've done. Right, perfect. And also, okay. you be aware, right, that vegans don't like taking vitamin D3 because it originates uh, from uh, sheep's wool. Right. Okay. And so, in fact, in India, the Indian government has permitted vitamin D2 fortification of both milk and cooking oil. All right. Well, it's been really interesting. Is, is there something else that you want to get off your mind before we, before we end up? Yes. So, basically, you need vitamin D from birth until death. And what we didn't talk about is what about during pregnancy? And so even before pregnancy. So there is information out there to suggest that vitamin D deficiency can cause infertility for both men and women. So especially during childbearing years, men and women should definitely be taking a vitamin D supplement. During pregnancy, vitamin D seems to help reduce risk of the most serious complication of pregnancy which is preeclampsia. It reduces risk for premature births, and it reduces risk for the need for cesarean sectioning. Hmm. We also know that infants born of vitamin D-sufficient moms are less risk for developing dental caries, less risk for developing um, asthma-like symptoms, wheezing disorders. So we think that during pregnancy, vitamin D is very important. And how much should they take? A study done in South Carolina by Bruce Hollis and Carol Wagner showed 4,000 units a day was ideal. Their blood levels in pregnant women were around 40 to 50 nanograms per ml, right? That preferred yeah. range. Yeah. And um, the evidence suggested that it did improve birth outcomes. That that really sounds quite quite important, especially when I mean, there, there's a lot of us having babies. So there you go. That that <laughs> seems a granddaughter. So all the more reason. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's it's so, it's so imp important with these things, especially especially during those critical time periods. Yes. All right. Well. It's been it's been an honor to have you on, and I I really want to give give you a, a big big thank you. It's been very interesting, and now I I think that all of us knows pretty much what we need to know to be able to get the health benefits from vitamin D. So so big big thank you. It's been a delightful experience, um, and enjoy. All right, take care. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. <clears throat> a rating and a review is a great thing, but if you will start to subscribe, you will make my heart sing. Have a great one, friends. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, including the giving of medical advice. The content of this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment.